This video is brought to you by Wren. What's up, guys? Helen here to talk about TV's oddest, greatest buddy comedy, Rick and Morty. The show has long reveled in absurdity and so crazy it's brilliant creativity. Still, its latest offering, Rick and Morty's Thanksploitation Spectacular, managed to surprise us with a bizarre plot featuring plenty of turkey on turkey violence. Blueberries! We got blueberries down! Hold your positions, it's a feeding frenzy! I can't see! But is there any depth beneath all the foul play? Get it? Foul play? like a bird. We think so. And we'd argue it has everything to do with the show calling BS on America's own self-mythologizing. We'll explain in this wisecrack quick take on Rick and Morty why Thanksgiving is a lie. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this video sponsor, Ren. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the constant bad news about climate change sucks. And the worst part is that I feel like there's nothing I can do about it. And this is where Ren comes in. Ren is a website that helps you calculate your carbon footprint and then shows you how you can offset your footprint by funding projects that do things like plant trees and protect rainforests. Rather than just feeling bad about the climate crisis, with Ren, you can actually do something about it, all without having to spend all day outside getting sweaty and dirty while planting trees. All you have to do is answer a few questions about your life style, and Ren will calculate your carbon footprint and help you reduce it. Now, as much as I've tried, no one can reduce their carbon footprint to zero, but you can offset what you have left after reducing it on your own, because you're already trying to reduce your carbon footprint on your own, right? Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution that will be used to offset your carbon footprint, you'll receive monthly updates from the projects you support. They'll actually send you pictures of trees that you planted so you can see what your money was spent on. And I mean, who doesn't want pictures of beautiful trees showing up in their inbox? We all know it's going to take a lot of work to slow down the climate crisis, so why not start today? We've partnered with Wren to protect five extra acres of rainforest for the first 100 people who sign up using our referral link. So go to www.wren.co slash join slash wisecrack to join us in saving the rainforest and fighting the climate crisis. That's wren.co slash join slash wisecrack. And now, back to the show. So what is this episode functionally doing? At first glance, it's pretty simple. Roasting America's history, and with that, it's present. There's the Statue of Liberty secretly being a Trojan horse concealing a steam-powered assassin, or FDR as a spider creature thanks to a bad vaccine. Side note, please get vaccinated, my dudes. You won't turn into a subterranean spider human. I promise. Anyway, no venerated aspect of American history, or present, is exempt from the show's irreverence. Especially not its presidents. Don't mythologize him, he was a politician. Or its congressman. President Curtis has enacted a plan to turn all turkeys in America into hybrid super soldiers. The move has 100% approval from Congress following its third pay raise in six hours. Or its favorite bird-centric holiday. And on America's birthday, or whatever the f Thanksgiving is. Now, you don't have to be history's biggest devil's advocate to understand where the show is coming from. American history has famously been edited, polished up, and at times, straight up turned into mythology. In fact, the early days of American studies, from the 1930s to the 50s, were dominated by the so-called myth and symbol school. It, as you might guess, looked for myths and symbols that allegedly attested to the specificity or even uniqueness of the US. As scholar Ica Paul writes in her book, The Myths That Made America. This effort was undertaken, as scholar Donald E. Pease notes, in search of historical confirmations of the nation's unique mission and destiny. In this way, America built a discourse establishing itself as what scholar Bernd Ostendorf calls a consciously constructed New World Utopia. That is, we got pretty comfy believing that we were doing something entirely new and totally radical. That's, of course, the perspective plenty of the joke characters in the episode embody. That little race car driver, you got bacon in your belly. What world you want him rearing up in? One where some spiky-haired Doctor Who in a lab coat can change the color of the sky? Or a world where he can fill his pickup with hot dogs and drive it to a jukebox full of our demographic's current favorite music? That said, according to folks like scholar John Coakley, myth, no matter how powerful, is not enough to form a national ideology on its own. It needs two side dishes. One is rituals, like funerals, military parades, or ahem, turkey pardonings which serve to remind people vividly of their membership in a community existing over time. And the other is symbols, lots of symbols, especially objects ranging from coins to flags to posters of Rosie the Riveter, which exist to elicit emotions in a community's members. 
All of this together constitutes what sociologist Robert Bella, way back in 1967, called America's elaborate and well-instituted civil religion. Here, civil religion means a collection of beliefs drawing partly from religion to create powerful symbols of national solidarity. Symbols that, you know, we might not want to see blown up in space. Why don't we just blow it up? It's a national monument. Now, of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with building national solidarity. But these myths, rituals, and symbols, i.e. this civil religion, shapes the way we view everything, from our presidents to our architecture to our army. And in fact, religious scholar Charles H. Long argues that America's civil religion breeds a kind of historical selectivity and blind faith in our innate goodness. At its worst, this can allow us to ignore and even perpetuate major social ills, like racism. And that's pretty clearly what Rick and Morty is making fun of. We see the way America's mythos is propagated through cultural products, like the country song which convinces all the soldiers that Now it's time to turn into a turkey. Here, evoking America's down-home country goodness successfully wrangles an army, despite the fact that these guys are really just fighting at the behest of a president engaged in a petty feud. Jesus, ever-loving Christ, why don't you two just f***ing get it over with? Or the way evoking country musician Johnny Cash and race car driver Dale Earnhardt in a political speech helps lure these men back into the turkey war. What would Johnny Cash or Dale Earnhardt say? He'd say it's time to walk the line or drive very fast between two of them. Now, some of our American mythologizing was born out of cultural necessity. Colonial America had to essentially create a past and a national character from scratch, in part to divorce themselves from Britain's storied national mythology. As scholar Henry Stokomager explained, nothing in the history of American nationalism is more impressive than the speed and the lavishness with which Americans provided themselves with a usable past. History, legends, symbols, paintings, sculpture, monuments, shrines, holy days, ballads, patriotic songs, heroes, and, with some difficulty, villains. We see this cultural iconography roundly degraded throughout Rick and Morty's patriotic roasting. Even the villain part, here mocked in the constant refrain about terrorists. You know, you use that word so much it's lost all meaning, Mr. P. As Paul writes, even as we have come a long way since the beginnings of the myth and symbol school, the entanglements between historical myth and contemporary ideology are as complex as they have ever been. We see this in the way one soldier, before being Turkified, evokes a noble call to duty that sounds like World War II era propaganda. That world needs a few good men in a secret Pentagon lab turning into turkeys. At the same time, the show critiques the far less savory realities of modern American warfare, which are often left out of the mainstream discourse. Whose side are we on? I don't know, but we've done enough to pay for college. In the post credit scene, we even see a veteran suffering from blueberry-induced PTSD and lacking adequate health care shrug off the president's failure to help him. It is fault our insurance got cut. We gotta build missiles. But before you go and pick up a Canadian passport, it's worth pointing out. America isn't alone in its proclivity for myth-making. Every country relies on cultural mythos, for reasons we'll get into. There's the way composer Richard Wagner's operas were used to rally German patriotism during Hitler's reign, or the way writer Alexander Pushkin helped define Russianness after the Napoleonic Wars. And even the way history is told fosters strong national identities. This makes sense. History, as it's practiced today, grew out of 19th century academia, a deeply nationalist period of Western history when countries like Italy and Germany were uniting several regional states under one national flag, while countries like Greece, Serbia, and Poland participated in revolutionary uprisings against the Ottoman and Russian empires. The result was that each country pretty much developed their own specific nationalist history, and that includes America's conception of itself within the 17th century puritanical paradigm of an explicitly Christian city on a hill. While these national perspectives have certainly been called into question by many historians, it hasn't vanished from the field. As historian E.J. Hobsbawm explained back in 1992, historians without a past are contradictions in terms. What makes a nation is the past, what justifies one nation against others is the past, and historians are the people who produce the past. Now, the fields of history and American studies have both, in recent decades, been complicated by new schools of thought that question these prevailing narratives. For Rick and Morty's part, Summer pipes up at one point, sharing a far more skeptical perspective about American history. Oh wow, wiping out a native population on Thanksgiving? That's never happened before. What did you just say? Still, the show argues that much of the nationalist myths propagated over centuries continue to stick around in our cultural psyche. Rick and Morty also suggests that the resulting mythologies many of us share about America are just as random and absurd as the idea that Thanksgiving was won by alien pilgrims and Native Americans who secretly got along. No wait, 
They love each other. This moment might also be explicitly critiquing the very real mythos about Thanksgiving, which posits peaceful corn sharing relations between white settlers and Native Americans, rather than, you know, a lot of genocide. Overall, the episode's own American mythology escalates into absurdity. Is that a turkey dinosaur? In this way, it draws into sharp relief the absurdity of our own real life myths about cherry trees and productive fair trade between white settlers and Native Americans. Oh, not to mention the intended sacrilege of releasing a Thanksgiving special in July. But why do we as societies like sharing myth after myth after myth? That is to say, what do mythologies practically do for us as a people? At a most basic level, they're necessary for maintaining collective identity. They provide a given society with a sense of coherence and continuity. But it goes deeper than that. Scholar Roland Barthes argues that myth functions literally as a sort of language we can all share in, what historian Lila Danielson describes as a mode of communication that disguises something that is contingent and socially constructed as natural and timeless. That is to say, myths treat America as the only possible outcome of history, rather than as a very carefully constructed human-made reality. And this sort of historical mythologizing can change the way a country feels entitled to behave. For example, the sense of a timeless, exceptional America has, historically, arguably made it possible for the country to justify lots of gnarly things, like unnecessary invasions of the Middle East or overthrowing democratically elected governments in Latin America. After all, if we're the greatest, our actions must be justified, right? This Rick and Morty episode underscores the importance of mythology and symbols in keeping society coherent and in creating a shared language for our nationalist impulses. Heritage destroyed. Moments like this suggest the importance of collective symbols in sustaining society as we know it. And at the end of the episode, we also see the risk a society faces when its myths get busted. After seeing everything he knew about America be upended, Morty comments, I always thought we were more special than that. Like we invented everything and did everything and that's why we own everything. Now I, I, I don't know what to feel. Here, he's lost the comforting language of the mythology he was raised on. The president offers a toothless, Feel thankful, Morty. Feel thankful. What Morty's facing is the destabilizing reality that America isn't what he thought it was. It's just like any other nation built on a foundation of myths and narratives, rather than on any real moral exceptionalism. And having had my own mind blown listening to Howard Zinn's People's History, largely because of Matt Damon's stellar narration, I know that's a lot for anyone to take in. But what do you guys think? Did Rick and Morty roast Thanksgiving like it's a prize turkey? Or is there still value in our national mythology? Let us know in the comments, and please don't get too angry at us. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support, hit that subscribe button like it's a superhuman turkey warrior, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.